so I am back first of all Jashma okay wearing my Jashma <laughs> I think it's reflecting a little bit you can't see me well can you see me well okay. give me a moment okay now you can see me well right all right so let's begin Sorry, uh, selfie stand use good news. So it's like the camera is on this side and I'm looking on this side to make sure I'm visible. It's a little topsy turvy. So forgive me for that. And <laughs> I haven't done much of a makeup today once again. So here is my book. I love it. It's technically, you know his book, Deepdut Patnayak's book, but I'll be reading it out to you and explaining elaboration by me. <laughs> okay, it's not a natural joke. It's seriously worth reading. So let's start from the prologue. Uh, it said that his driver made all the drawings in this book. It's worth seeing. I'm not promoting his book. so. <laughs> no, just kidding. So I can I hope it's visible. It's a beautiful drawing. So let's begin. Its prologue is Descent from Ayodhya. Okay, I have to look at the left. Okay. Okay, so I guess we can continue. Blades of grass, ends of her hair sticking out. That is all that was left of Sita after she had plunged into the earth. No more would she be seen walking above the ground. The people of Ayodhya watched their king caress the grass for a long time, stole the seat, stole, stoic and serene as ever, not a teardrop in his eyes. They wanted to fall at his feet and ask his forgiveness. They wanted to hug and comfort him. They had broken his heart and wanted to apologize, but they knew he neither blamed them nor judged them. They were his children and he, their father, Lord of the Raghu clan, ruler of Ayodhya, was Sita's realm. I guess you understood. It's pretty clear that Ram's basically banished Sita unwillingly. He didn't want to because a king must set an example for the whole kingdom to follow so he had to do this he had to force Sita to go away and back then he was not aware that Sita was pregnant with both of his children love and Kush and so after handing over, just like in Mahabharat, after Ganga handed over Bhishma to his father, she went away. Just that Ganga never died. She's still flowing. And Sita went back to her mother, which was the earth. Okay. Come, it is time to go home, said Ram, placing his hands on the shoulders of Love and Kush, his, two, his twin sons. Home? Was not the forest their home? That was where they had lived all their lives. But they did not argue with the king. The stranger, this man whom they now had to call their father, who until recently had been their enemy. But their mother's last instruction to them was very clear. Do as your father says. They would not disobey. They too would be sons worthy of the Rahu clan. They had known only their mother for their lives till then and for them seeing their mother for the last time and her last words were everything. So do as your father says it is. As the royal elephant carrying the king and his twin sons passed through the city gates. Hanuman, the monkey servant of Ram, 
caught sight of Yama, the god of death, hiding behind the trees, looking intently at Ram. Hanuman immediately lashed his tail on the ground, a warning to the god of death not to come anywhere near the king or his family. A frightened Yama stayed away from Yayodhya. But Ram's brother Lakshman did not stay away from Yama. A few days later, for some mysterious reason, Lakshman left the city and walked deep into the forest and beheaded himself. Hanuman did not understand. His word, his world was crumbling. First Sita, then Lakshman. Who next? Ram? He could not let that happen. He would not let that happen. He refused to budge from the gates of Ayodhya. No one would go in or out. Shortly thereafter, Ram lost his ring. It slipped from his finger and fell into a crack in the palace floor. Will you fetch it for me, Hanuman? requested Ram. Shortly, ever willing to please his master, Hanuman reduced himself to the size of a bee and slipped into the crack in the floor. To his surprise, it was no ordinary crack. It was a tunnel, one that went deep into the bowels of the earth. It led him to Nagaloka, the abode of snakes. As soon as he entered, he found two serpents coiling around his feet. He flicked them away. They returned with a couple more serpents. Hanuman flicked them to away too. Before long, Hanuman found himself enwrapped by a thousand serpents, determined to pin him down. He gave in and allowed them to drag him to their king, Vasuki, a serpent with seven hoods, each displaying a magnificent jewel. What brings you to Nagaloka? hissed Vasuki. I seek a ring. Oh, that! I will tell you where it is if you tell me something first. What? asked Hanuman. The root of every tree that enters the earth whispers a name. Sita. Who is she? Do you know? She is the beloved of the man whose ring I seek. Then call, tell me all about her and tell me about her beloved and I will point you to the ring. There is another drawing. I think you should see it. If you want, you can pause it and see it for as long as you want. So, let's continue. Nothing will give me greater joy than narrating the story of Sita and her Ram. Much of what I will tell you, I experienced myself. Some I have heard from others within all these stories is the truth. Who knows it all? Varuna had but a thousand eyes, Indra a hundred, and I only two. I love this line. I'll tell you why. Who knows it all? It's a question. Varuna had but a thousand eyes, Indra a hundred, and I... Only two. How much can you know? How much can you see? No amount of sight is enough to know the truth. It isn't. And even if at times people make mistakes, they have up to only two eyes. They don't have a hundred or a thousand and even after having thousands and hundreds of eyes, these people made mistakes. They weren't people. But you know, these are basically mythological stories which are made to make humankind learn lessons and be able to live better. So, I love this line. Just as I am a fan of Joker, he's still on my Almira. You can see it. There you are. <laughs> this lens, my thing. Who knows it all? Varuna has but a thousand eyes, Indra a hundred, and I only two. All the serpents of Nagaloka gathered around Hanuman, eager to hear his tale. There is no sun or moon in Nagaloka, nor is there fire. The only light came from the seven luminous jewels on the seven hoods of Vasuki, but that was enough. Book 1 
birth. She was born of the earth and raised amongst sages. Guess who she is? Sita, our beloved Sita. Picture. Pause it. I can't wait for you to see. <laughs> okay. There's another one. The chapter's name is Foundling in the Furrow. Isn't it cute? It was the start of the sowing season. The fences separated the farm from the jungle outside the black buck roamed free within the farmer would decide what was the crop and what was weed. The farmers invited their king Janaka to be the first to plough the land with a golden hoe. To the sound of bells and drums and conch shell trumps, the king shoved the hoe into the ground and began to till the land. Soft, moist earth, dark as the night sky, was pushed away on either side to reveal a furrow. As the furrow extended itself firmly and fast, the king felt confident and the farmers were pleased. Suddenly, the king stopped. The furrow revealed a golden hand, tiny fingers rising up like grass, as if drawn by the sunshine. Janaka moved the dirt away and found hidden within the soft, moist earth a baby, a girl, healthy and radiant, smiling joyfully as if waiting to be found. Oh my god, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> that is actually the originality of being a female, soft-hearted, kind, radiant, like a tree who bears fruit. I'm not reading it out. I mean it. And I don't prepare any of my videos. I just speak what I feel. Was it an abandoned child? No, said the farmers, convinced it was a gift from the earth goddess to the childless king. But this was not fruit of a seed. How could she be his daughter? Fatherhood, said Janaka, springs in the heart, not from a seed. Now that's something to learn from, isn't it? I'll repeat it for some of you who need the sentence to be heard thousand times in your head. Fatherhood, said Janaka, springs in the heart, not from a seed. Just like Yashoda was a mother, equally, like Krishna's biological mother. Let's continue. Janaka picked up the infant who gurgled happily in his arms. Placing her close to his heart, he declared, This is Bhumija, daughter of the earth. You may call her Maithi, princess of Mithila, or Vaidehi, lady from Videha, or Janaki, she who chose Janaka. I will call her Sita, she who was found in a furrow, she who chose, chose me to be her father to see the amount of respect he is giving her, the amount of love he has for her. Love your children, just like that. Everyone felt gladness in their hearts. The ceremony was truly successful. The childless king had returned to the palace a father. No harvest could be better. A daughter called Shanta. Dashratha, king of Ayodhya in the land of Kursala, also had a daughter. Her name was Shanta, she who was peaceful, but she did not bring Dashratha's peace, for he wanted sons. So Dashratha went north to Kekaya and asked King Ashwapati for his daughter's hand in marriage. It was foretold the princess would bear an illustrious son. The king objected. Kaushalya is already your wife and has given you a daughter. If my Kaikei 
marries you, she will just be a junior queen. But if she bears me a son, he will be king and she will be queen mother, argued Dashratha, to convince Ashwapati, who let him marry Kaikeyi. Unfortunately, Kaikeyi gave birth to neither son nor daughter, so Dashratha married a third time, a woman named Sumitra, but even she failed to produce a child. Dashratha was filled with despair. Who would he pass on the crown to? And how would he face his ancestors in the land of the dead? across the river Vaitarni, for they would ask him if he had left behind sons who would left and help them be born. That is when Rompala, king of Anga, came to him and said, My kingdom is struck with drought because Indra, ruler of the sky, god of rain, is afraid, one of my subjects, Rishyaringa, son of Vibhadaka, a mighty hermit. This same Rishyaringa, who causes drought in my kingdom is, I am sure, the cause of your childlessness. The crisis will end only if my daughter succeeds in seducing this hermit and turns him into a householder, thus tempering his powers to Indra's satisfaction. But I have no daughter, Dashratha. Let me adopt yours, and if she succeeds in bringing rain to Anga, I will make sure that Risharinga compels Indra to give you sons. Suddenly the daughter became the answer to Dashratha's problems. So daughters aren't useless. Here he is gambling it, but daughters are beautiful. <laughs> know that. The abduction of Rishya Shringa. <laughs> okay. Let's see how he gets abducted. We're only in page 12. Lots to go. Don't worry, this video will be 30 minutes, not more, because I know it's difficult for anyone to listen to a video for more than 30 minutes, and people don't like more than that, so I'm not going to waste any time for you. The Abduction of Rishya Shringa Vibhandaka was called a Rishi, a seer, because he saw what others did not. He knew that food turns into sap, then blood, then flesh, then nerve, then bone, then marrow, and finally seed. When seed is shred, new life comes into being. No living creature has control over the shedding of the seed, except humans, especially men. When seed is retained in the body, it turns into ojas. Ojas can be turned into tapa through the practice of tapasya. Tapa is fire in, of the mind generated through meditation and contemplation. With Tapa comes Siddha, the power to control nature, the power to compel gods to bring down rain, make barren women fertile, sterile men virile, to walk on wa water and fly without wings. Vibhandaka was determined to perform Tapasya, churn Tapa, acquire Siddha, control nature and make her dance to his funeral. Fearful that Vibhandaka would succeed and use Siddha against him, Indra sent an Apsara, a damsel from his paradise, to seduce him. The mere sight of this Apsara caused Vibhandaka to lose control of his senses. Semen squirted out of his body, much against his will, and fell on the grass. A doe ate this, so powerful was the semen that it made the doe pregnant. She gave birth to a human male child with antlers, who came to be known as Rishyashringa. Vibhandaka saw Rishya Shringa as a symbol of his personal failure and so raised him with rage and ambition without any knowledge of women. He drew a line around his hermitage. Nothing feminine could cross this line and approach his son. Neither a cow nor a mare, neither goose, ear, doe, or nor so. No flowers bloomed here and there was no nectar or fragrance. It was a barren land. Any woman who dared cross the line around Vibhandaka's hermitage instantly burnt into ashes. Which is why Indra could not send his Apsaras to seduce Rishya Shringa. Furious Indra had refused to come anywhere near Anga, where the hermitage was located, until the ruler of Anga resolved this problem. The resulting drought compelled Rompada to seek out the woman of his land. But no man was willing to risk the life of his wife or sister or daughter. Even the king's queens, concubines, and courtesans refused to help. That is why Rompada needed Shanta, renowned not just for her beauty but also for her intelligence and courage. Shanta waited for the few hours in the day when Vibhandaka left the hermitage. 
to gather food from the forest. During that window of opportunity, she stood outside the gates and sang songs of love and passion, drawing Rishi Shringa towards her. The young, innocent ascetic wondered what kind of creature she was. At first, he feared her sight. Then he allowed himself to enjoy her song, and finally he had the courage to talk to her. I am a woman, revealed Shanta, a different kind of human. You can create life outside your body, but I can create life inside mine. Rishishringa did not understand. If you step out, said Shanta, I will show you. Rishishringa was too afraid to cross the threshold, so from afar he watched Shanta reveal the secrets of her body, arousing in him emotions and desires and a deep sense of loneliness he had never known before. When Rishishringa told his father about this creature, Vibhandaka warned him, She is a monster who seeks to enslave you. Stay away from her. But try as he might, Rishashringa could not stop thinking about her. After days and nights of suffering, he could not hold back any more. When his father was away, he found the courage to cross the boundary of Vibhandaka's hermitage and offered himself freely to Shanta. She returned triumphant to Anga with Rishashringa in her arms. Let's see. Okay, I think we can cover some more time. Okay. Dashatha gets four sons. The rains poured, flowers bloomed and beckoned the bees. The bull sought the cow and the buck sought the doe. All was well in Anga. Rumpada kept his promise and requested Rishishringa to help Dashatha father's sons. Rishishringa readily agreed. Well, first, in the secrets of nature, he decided to conduct a yagna. Rishishringa declared Dashrata as the yagaman, initiator of the yagna, and prepared the altar with the fire and chanted potent hymns to invoke the devas. He instructed Dashrata to feed the devas who were being invoked with offerings of clarified butter. Each time Dashrata poured ghee into the fire, he was asked to say Swaha, reminding the gods. It was he who was feeding them. As the devas burped in satisfaction, Rishishringa requested the gods to satisfy Dashrata's hunger in exchange. In the invocation, the offerings and the requests continued until the devas were so pleased that from the yagna emerged a portion that the havis, this when consumed by Dashrata's wives, would enable them to bear sons. Dashrata gave half the portion to Kaushalya, the wife he respected, and half to Kaikai, the wife he loved. Gaushalya gave a quarter of her portion to Simitra as she felt she should not be overlooked. Kaike did the same. As a result, Kaushalya gave birth to Ram, Kaike to Bharata, and Sumitra to the twins Lakshman and Shatrughana. Dashrata's three wives could become mothers of four sons, all because of his daughter Shanta. We have some more time. Sulabha and Janaka. Yeah, we can do this. Okay, this is the last chapter for today. Maybe you should consider calling Rishyashringa to Mithila with the advice Janaka received often enough. Since the arrival of Sita, his wife Sunaina had given birth to a daughter who was named Urmila, and Janaka's brother Kushadhwaja had fathered two daughters, Mandavi and Shruta Kirti. Four daughters to two brothers in the land of Viveha, but no sons. Janaka would respond, the earth grants Janaka what he deserves. The fire grants Dashrata what he wants. I choose the destiny of daughters. He submits to the desire of sons. Word of this reached a woman called Sulabha. In beautiful attire and beautiful form, she approached the king and demanded a private audience with him. Everyone wondered why. Sulabha noticed the king's awkwardness and asked, This land is called Videha, meaning beyond the body. I assume the king of this land would value my mind more than my body, but I assume wrong. Janaka felt acutely embarrassed as being chastised so. Sulva continued, Humans are special. We have a mind that can imagine. With imagination, we can, without moving, travel through space and time, conjure up situations that do not exist in reality. This is what separates humanity from the rest of nature. Such a mind is called Manas, which is why humans are called Manavas. You are a manava with male flesh, I am a manava with female flesh. We both see the world differently, not because we have different bodies, but because we have different minds. 
you see the world from one point of view i see the world from another point of view but adam our minds could expand i can see the world from your point of view and you can see it from mine some like vibhandaka and rishishringa instead of expanding the mind use it to control nature through tapasya and yagna they do not accept the world as it is why inquire into the human mind janaka and you will be better understand the flesh and the world around this flesh this is veda wisdom inspired by these words janaka invited to his land all the rishis of arya vrata to share the knowledge of the vedas they emerged from caves from mountain tops from river banks and seashores and traveled to janaka's court to exchange ideas and discover other ways of seeing the world this conference of intimate conversations that would eventually broaden the gaze of humanity came to be known as the upanishad i think this chapter should be read okay this chapter is called the upanishad and that's the reason i said it should be read sita attended the conference with her father at first clinging on to his shoulders then seated on his lap and finally following him around observing him engaged with hundreds of sages amongst them ashtavakra gargi and yagna valkya when ashtavakra was still in his mother's womb he had corrected his father's understanding of the vedas infuriated his father had cursed him to be born with eight bends in his body hence his name one who had eight deformities without realizing it i threatened my father ashtavakra said to janaka animals fight to defend their bodies humans curse to defend the imagination of themselves this imagined notion of who we are and who others are supposed to see us is called aham aham constantly seeks validation from the external world when that is not forthcoming it becomes insecure aham makes humans accumulate things through things we hope people will look upon us as we imagine ourselves that is why janaka people display their wealth and their knowledge and their power aham yearns to be seen gargi was a lady who questioned everything why does this world exist what binds the sky to the earth why do we imagine why do we flatter ourselves with imagination why does the shatha yearn for sons why is janaka satisfied with daughters what makes one king so different from another this angered many sages who told her if you ask so many questions your head will fall off but gargi persisted undeterred she was hungry for answers she did not care if her head fell off she would grow a new head then a wiser one yagna valkya revolted against his own teacher who refused to answer questions he refused to accept that the purpose of tapasya and yagna was to compel nature to do humanity's bidding he approached the sun god surya who sees everything for answers surya explained to him how fear of death makes plants seek nourishment and grow towards sunlight and water fear of death is what makes animals run towards pastures and prey at the same time yearning for life makes animals hide and run from predators but human fear is unique fueled by imagination it seeks value and meaning do i matter what makes me matter thus informed yagna valkya shared his understanding of manas in the court of janaka every human creates his own imagined version of the world and of himself every human is therefore brahma creator of his own aham aham brahma swami Brahmasmi, I am Brahma. That tva, that tva, asi. So are you. We knot our imagination with fear to create aham. The pasya and yagna are two tools that can help us unknot the mind, outgrow fear, and discover atma, our true self. Tell me more about atma, said Janaka. Yagna Valkya said, Atma is the Brahman, a fully expanded mind. atma is the mind that does not fear death or yearn for life it does not seek validation it witnesses the world as it is atma is ishwar also known as shiva who performs tapasya is self contained and self sufficient atma is bhagwan also known as vishnu who conducts a yagna to nourish everyone even though he needs no nourishment may brahma's head keep falling off till he finds the brahman sadashivat ashtavakra Who will facilitate this? Asked Gargi. The Brahmin, transmitter of the Vedas, said Yagna Valkya. Today's date is nine twenty nine minutes forty seconds, forty one, forty two, forty three. Here it goes. So this is episode two of me elaborating. 
Dr. Deva Dutt Patnaik Sita, an illustrated retelling of the Ramayana. And with this, I wish you a happy Janmashtami. May God bless you. May God bless everyone. And Pranam.